We start with general questions, and our first question this morning is from Maureen Watt. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the European election results, what discussions it has had with its UK counterparts regarding Brexit. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Thank you, presiding officer. The Scottish Government has consistently made clear its position on Brexit to the UK Government. There have as yet been no discussions between UK and Scottish ministers on the outcome of the election results. But the situation where our views, the views of this Parliament, and indeed the people of Scotland are ignored, is now completely untenable. The result of Thursday's election demonstrates once again that there is overwhelming support in Scotland for remaining in the EU. It is unacceptable for precious time to be wasted by internal Conservative Party faction fighting rather than accepting the urgent need for a second EU referendum with the option to remain. Maureen Wood. I thank um, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As he said, given the complete disarray and chaos ripping the Tory party apart and that the fact that they can't even work with themselves, let alone anyone else, it's encouraging that in your statement yesterday, C Cabinet Secretary, you signalled the Scottish Government's willingness to work with other parties opposed to Brexit. So can you out outline what steps you're taking to that end? Cabinet Secretary. Indicated to the Chamber yesterday that the invitation to take part in cross-party talks uh, is open. Uh, I'm glad that the Labour Party and the Scottish Green Party have accepted that invitation. Um, I have not had an acceptance from the Conservative Party or the Liberal Democrats as yet. I would like to have that. My intention is to appoint an interlocutor who will talk to each of the parties to discover their views and, and their, what they would like to, the agenda to be and where their positioning is. And the key issue here is, if they, if they accept the thesis that there is a problem, what are the solutions to the problem which they are proposing? Uh, and I'm very interested to hear those solutions. And that is being done uh, without prejudice, as I said, and without precondition. And I would urge the other parties to accept that and to start on this process with ourselves. We're trying to do it in a way that is least threatening uh, and most likely to produce some progress. Question number two, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it is seeking to support people in Scotland who have been impacted by the Easter terror attacks in Sri Lanka. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. My thoughts remain with all those affected, both in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. We condemn all incidents of religious prejudice, hatred and targeting of people based on their beliefs. Following the attacks, I sent letters to a number of church leaders across Scotland offering condolences and solidarity. In addition, and as part of a regular engagement with Scotland's Christian communities, I will be meeting with church leaders next week, where I will offer again our continued support. Bob Doris. I'm very he pleased to hear that, presiding officer. I am hoping to meet Fiona Hislop soon with constituents who lost loved ones in terror attacks in Sri Lanka uh, to see how Scotland can support Sri Lanka at this difficult time. However, some of my Muslim constituents inform me of attacks and intimidation on their family and friends who remain in Sri Lanka following the terror attacks. Can I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, to show you to offer your support and your solidarity to them and their loved ones at this hugely difficult time, and to also join my call and the Sri Lankan government to do all they can to bring communities together following the terror attacks? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, and I've, uh, of course I really recognise and appreciate the real interest that Bob Doris uh, takes in this issue and have discussed uh, previously with him some of his ideas about how he intends to, to mark what has uh, happened in Sri Lanka. And of course we will continue to stand in solidarity with Muslim acro communities across the world and our thoughts and condolences remain with any victim uh, or family or community affected by uh, dreadful acts of terror. And of course we uh, continue to stand united against Islamophobia and all hate because everybody should feel safe as they go about their daily lives and I understand that uh, Bob Doris has written to Fiona Hislop and I understand that there will be a, a meeting uh, an offer of a meeting with Mr McPherson who would be best placed uh, to address some of the issues that Mr Doris uh, articulates in his capacity as Minister for Europe Migration and International Development. Nonetheless with my portfolio responsibility for faith I will be uh, more than willing to continue to engage with uh, Mr Doris and of course to continue to take a real interest in the uh, pursuit of making sure that people feel respected and supported here in Scotland and, of course, across the world. Question number three, Bill Bowman. I ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the talks between the Confederation of Passenger Transport and Transport Scotland regarding the National Concessionary Travel Scheme cap. Cabinet Secretary, Michael Matheson. Bus operators have long held that the Concessionary Travel Scheme cap is inconsistent with the principle of fair embusment. 
Uh, our view remains that the cap is needed to safeguard taxpayers' interests. Without it, there would be no way to control expenditure on what is a demand-led scheme. My officials and I have met with CPT to discuss operators' concerns and I've asked my officials to work with them to further improve how we forecast and monitor reimbursement claims under the scheme and to report to me regularly during the year on trends and the likelihood of the cap being exceeded. Bill Bowman. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Last week I was made aware of the situation in Dundee whereby public transport operators carried concession customers free of charge for what was initially 11 days but now reduced to six days in March, a week in effect of no payment. The reason being Transport Scotland's original under-budgeting of the National Concessionary Travel Scheme. Will the Cabinet Secretary look at what measures can be implemented to ensure that Dundee bus operators are treated fairly under the scheme without disadvantaging those who rely on it most if your scheme again doesn't cover payment for the whole year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign off. So the uh, rate of uh, repayment that's made to bus operators is actually agreed with the uh, CPT and their members at the beginning of the financial year, as was the case uh, for this uh, existing financial year. What I can say to the member is that I've also agreed with CPT to review the existing economic model that's used in order to assess what the potential cost could be to operators in the next financial year uh, and to consider what further improvements can be undertaken to monitor the scheme uh, to ensure that we have as accurate a picture as possible about the cost to bus operators across the country. And Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Chamber how much has been invested in the scheme since it was first started in 2006? How many people have benefited from it and how many more passengers stand to benefit from the extension of the scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the demands on the concessionary travel scheme continue to increase as it's proven to be a very popular scheme and is uh, being used uh, ever increasingly by uh, members of the public who qualify for it. So, for example, uh, last year we invested over uh, £202 million in the concessionary travel scheme and in this financial year we're investing a further £213 million in the scheme to make sure uh, that we continue to support those who make use of the concessionary travel programme. Thank you. Question number four, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Police Scotland. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, Hamza Youssef. Uh, the Scottish Government meets with Police Scotland on a regular basis uh, to discuss a wide variety of issues. I often meet uh, with senior officers. Uh, I last met with the Chief Constable uh, on the 4th uh, of April alongside the First Minister, uh, and I'll be meeting him uh, later today. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that Police Scotland should ensure that all accusations of sexual abuse, including within football clubs, are investigated thoroughly and those found guilty are to account, held to account to the full force of the law? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course, I agree with that. I'd probably go a step further and say that uh, it's not a case that Police Scotland should, uh, but they, uh, they do uh, absolutely investigate uh, any allegations of, of sexual abuse, be they historical or, or, or be they uh, more recent. Uh, the Scottish Government obviously takes its responsibilities to ensure that children are safe and can enjoy taking part in sport, uh, as well as giving parents confidence over the safety. Uh, we take that extremely, extremely seriously. But we've seen from recent cases uh, that uh, of individuals who have been tried uh, in the courts and been found guilty, that obviously Police Scotland take this matter very seriously. They investigate uh, regardless of, of whether it's at a football club uh, or indeed coming from, from anywhere else. So I hope that gives the member uh, some element uh, of confidence. Question number five, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent reports concerning the awarding of contracts to and the future of BICAP. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. As we understand it, the contract for the Nars Nagreer uh, offshore wind project has not yet been awarded and as such it would be inappropriate to speculate on potential future contract awards which relate to commercial matters uh, for the parties involved. I reiterate the Scottish Government fully supports efforts by the industry, trade unions and campaigners to increase the number and value of contracts awarded to Scotland's supply chain and we will continue to do what we can to ensure that a greater share of the work for offshore wind projects stays in Scotland. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Does the Minister agree with me that following yesterday's passionate speeches and from MSPs from all across the Chamber that EDF can be in no doubt about the strength of feeling in Scotland which is evident in the Fife Ready for Renewal campaign that BIFAB must benefit from the awarding of contracts for the NNG project and will he agree to take action on areas that are within his powers 
on the weaknesses in the current procurement and contracting system that was identified by members yesterday that are disadvantaging Scottish companies? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, certainly in terms of the, the latter point that Claire Baker makes, um, as uh, Mr Mackay and myself made clear yesterday, we absolutely are committed to using the powers that we have in the Scottish Government to, to try and maximise the opportunities. We're not prepared to tolerate the position that has emerged in recent, uh, recent years uh, of uh, contracts happening with, with limited con uh, content from the Scottish supply chain. So we will use potentially, as the Cabinet Secretary said yesterday, uh, powers around decommissioning liabilities and also the uh, leasing round for the next uh, Crown State leasing round uh, to try and maximise opportunities. In terms of actions that others have to take, as we said yesterday, the UK Government must review the CFD process, the contract for a different process, and ensure that it is doing everything in its powers to maximise the chance for the supply chain. But clearly we can be left in no doubt yesterday the view of this chamber about the strength of feeling there is that Scotland needs to get a fair share of the activity in these projects. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. I thought the Cabinet Secretary, Derek Mackay, was quite clear yesterday that he does intend to use his powers under the Crown Estate Act to influence the leasing to ensure that wind farms on the coast of Scotland are actually being built and manufactured here as well, supporting communities in Fife and elsewhere. However, will this be too late now for the National Garth Wind Farm and others that are currently in the pipeline that Bifab desperately need to have contracts for in order to, in order to retain jobs at Methyl and in Arnish? Minister. Uh, well, as I said in my original answer, uh, there's obviously some sensitivity around the uh, contracting process involved with the EDF and uh, their supply chain at this moment in time, so we, we can't intervene directly in commercial matters, but I think the Chamber left uh, all developers in absolutely no doubt the strength of feeling there was across the, the Parliament yesterday. Uh, certainly, uh, my risk is absolutely correct. The Cabinet Secretary is looking very closely at how we use the existing uh, Crown State powers that have come to us through the establishment of Crown State Scotland uh, to look at the leasing round and next leasing round and ensure that we do uh, avoid a situation where uh, supply chain misses out in that work. Uh, but as regards existing projects, clearly we have to try and work very closely with the developers to identify challenges for particular supply chain companies, maximise their chance of winning work, make them as competitive as possible. But clearly Parliament has left uh, everybody in no doubt exactly how strongly we all feel. Question number six, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it can take to ensure that customers pay a fair tariff for their home energy bills, including older people. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government funds Home Energy Scotland to give people advice on how to reduce their energy bills. Since December 2015, almost 15,000 vulnerable citizens, including older people, have been helped to switch to a better deal. As well as this, the Scottish Government's uh, new Energy Consumer Action Plan sets out how we will deliver a fair energy market for all, even though energy prices remain reserved to UK Government. Uh, through a new Improving Consumers Outcomes Fund, we'll explore how to set up collective switches to ensure consumers pay a fair price for their energy. Thank the Minister for that response. There's clearly a lot going on to help reduce energy consumption and bills. However, accessing information on how to reduce energy bills is usually online and includes information about how to change suppliers. Given this, what specific measures is the government taking to ensure that elderly people, many of whom do not have access to the internet, can take advantage of the help that was available? Minister. Well, Margaret Mitchell makes a very fair point and a very reasonable one there around the, we know that from the work of the Scottish Annual Household Survey that uh, older people, especially those, those aged 60 and older, are significantly less likely to use the internet, which means older population tends to have less access to price comparison websites, uh, which can direct them to the best tariff. So as a result, the service offered by Home Energy Scotland, and we put £5.1 million through the Energy Saving Trust to deliver this service, is particularly valuable for older customers. We encourage members across the chamber to make sure their uh, constituents are aware of the opportunities there and to use that service as fully as they can. Pauline McNeill. There's currently no requirement for energy providers to contact customers and particularly on the priority services register to offer them the best deal. So that would include older people, disabled people and chronically sick people and many others. Um, would the Scottish Government support the idea that the energy companies should be more proactive, particularly older people and people on the priority services register? And there's a case for saying that it should go wider than that. The energy providers should be required to contact people directly and offer them the best deals they have. Minister. Uh, Pauline McNeill makes some very fair points. Again, to point out that these matters are, are unfortunately not uh, powers that this, this Parliament holds, but we are working with 
the big six energy providers and more generally with the energy sector through the uh, summits that we've held, uh, uh, the Scottish Government has chaired, to try and encourage suppliers to work proactively with vulnerable customers and the priority services list. And indeed, I'm, I'm pleased to say that many of the companies are doing that proactively now to try and move people off standard variable tariffs, to try and make sure that they are on the fairest tariff that's available to them and to, to also contact those who they're hearing very little from. So there's obviously more passive customers that perhaps aren't aware of the opportunity to switch services. Thank you. Question number seven has not been lodged. Question number eight, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports fair work. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Fair work is central to delivering inclusive growth and remains a flagship policy for this Government. We published our Fair Work Action Plan in February, setting out the action we will take to achieve the vision for Scotland to be a fair work nation by 2025. For as long as employment powers are reserved, we will use all levers available, including attaching Fair Work First criteria to as many funding streams business support grants and public contracts as we can to deliver our ambitions for fair work. I will host a cross-party roundtable in June to consider what more we might do to drive fair work across Scottish workplaces. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, with an estimated 270,000 people in Scotland combining work with caring responsibilities, will the Minister join me ahead of Carers Week next month in encouraging more businesses and employers, including MSPs, to become carer-positive employers? Minister. Yes, I, I would echo that call. The uh, employers who are registered as carer positive uh, employ some 330,000 uh, staff, but we want those numbers uh, to continue uh, to grow. Uh, in my previous role as the Minister for Sport, Health and Improvement Mental Health, I had responsibility for this area. I was able to see the good work that scheme uh, did then. I'm able to continue seeing that uh, now in my current uh, role. I am uh, registered as a, a carer positive employer um, and uh, along with the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing, I wrote to all MSPs earlier this year to encourage them to become similarly uh, recognised and I reiterate that call again today, President Officer. Question number nine, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And can I refer members to my register of interest with regard to both Unite and Unison and ask the Scottish Government when it last met the SQA and what was discussed? Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, I hold regular meetings with the Chair and Chief Executive of the SQA. I last met them both on the 16th of April, where a range of matters were discussed. Scottish Government officials are also in regular contact with SQA officials. Elaine Smith. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. When one of my colleagues, uh, one of my Labour colleagues, asked about potential industrial action at the SQA on 1st May, the Cabinet Secretary told the Chamber, and I quote, that some of the trade unions have been in agreement with the restructuring proposals that the Scottish Qualifications Authority has taken forward. However, as confirmed by Labour this morning, the unions at the SQA, Unite and Unison, are not in fact supportive of the restructuring proposals. So can I ask the Education Secretary if he's not speaking with the staff at the SQA, where is he getting his information? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, obviously, I'm, I, I'm, the SQA is a self-governing body, uh, it's, uh, and I have no employment responsibility with the SQA. The information I shared with the Chamber is information shared with me by the leadership of the SQA on the discussions that they have had. Uh, Elaine Smith has provided me this morning with new information. I will explore that information and I will write to her once I have ex explored and examined the issues that she has raised with me this morning. Thank you. Question number 10, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what is doing to increase low carbon travel opportunities in the North East. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. We have invested in the North East to promote low carbon travel opportunities, including uh, almost £3 million to support electric vehicle charging infrastructure, low carbon vehicles, and hydrogen buses since 2017. Over £1.2 million to support bus infrastructure to encourage more people to use buses uh, in the same time period. And between 2013 and 2016, provided almost £2.5 million to promote cycling, walking and safer streets to promote cycle training in schools as well. In addition to that, the AWPR will reduce journey times across Aberdeen by up to half at peak periods and free up roads for more public transport, faster journeys and improved reliability. Julian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Many of my constituents would like to be able to enjoy the benefits of rail travel. We have an opportunity to reopen the Fermartin Buchan rail line and tempt the people of Aberdeenshire East and Banff from Buchan out of their cars, onto which they, on which they currently rely for their daily commute into Aberdeen City. In the light of the climate emergency, would the Cabinet Secretary consider looking at improved rail infrastructure in those parts of the country who are currently ill-served by rail? 
Camera Secretary. Mr Officer, as the member will be aware, we're already making a substantial amount of investment in rail in the north-east of Scotland, with some £330 million being invested in the area at the present time. Uh, we're always keen to look at whether there are opportunities to expand our rail network and to help to support local communities. We have the Local Rail Development Fund, which allows local communities to start the process of looking at developing rail routes within their area. And that may be one of the options that's available to the local community in this instance. Beyond that, it would have to fit into our wider uh, strategic transport projects review, the STPR2 process, uh, which can consider other proposed programmes, including the one uh, which the member has made reference to.